Vamos a por la segunda de la tarde. Eh, es un placer para mí estar aquí eh, tratando temas tan interesantes y, además, eh, yo diría que tan eh, cuestionados desde una perspectiva no científica, cuando a veces científicamente las cosas están bastante claras, pero que, en cualquier caso, generan debate social siendo eh, de origen eh, científico. Eh, antes de introducir a eh, la autora Madaka Tumbo, voy a decir eh, simplemente tres palabras, y es que, en línea con lo que viene trabajando Maine en los últimos años, que ha estado centrado mucho en objetivos de desarrollo sostenible, me parece una idea estupenda el haber traído eh, a este foro el tema de la justicia y el clima, dos elementos que están vinculados, que están vinculados a los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible y a eh, lo que el secretario general de las Naciones Unidas eh, eh, llama un nuevo concepto de dignidad que incluye eh, seguridad, libertad y justicia. Y dentro de estos campos, evidentemente, está el de un medio ambiente seguro y un desarrollo sostenible. En ambos conceptos tenemos todos los temas medioambientales, en este caso, la sostenibilidad del clima como elementos clave. Bien, eh, como les digo, es un placer para mí presentar a doña Madaka eh, Tumbo, que es eh, una autora especialista y reconocida eh, en todo el mundo, eh, procedente de Tanzania, que ha centrado sus investigaciones y sus trabajos en la Universidad de Dar el Salam, donde ha ido, por así decirlo, poquito a poco, escalando eh, peldaños hasta eh, convertirse en eh, la, eh, una profesora dedicada a, eh, a la investigación en el Instituto del Agua. Ella ha tratado temas de clima, ella ha tratado temas de género, ella ha tratado muchos temas de financiación al desarrollo y eh, los ha tratado en unos casos de forma individual, en otros casos de forma transversal. Por eso yo creo que es un acierto traerla aquí para eh, tratar eh, de eh, la cuestión del clima social y, eh, perdón, <risa> cambio climático y justicia social, porque son temas que eh, hacerlos transversales es eh, sumamente interesante. Bien, pues eh, no me quiero enrollar más, simplemente darle muchas gracias. Eh, thank you very much for coming here, for let us listen everything you have to tell us that will be surely very helpful. Thank you very much. Pues con ella les dejo, muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Ruth, and I would also like to thank uh, both organizers and the scientific for committee for uh, this conference, but I would also to thank the Maynell Foundation for all the support and make making sure that this e event is a su success. Uh, I'm happy to be here, and I'll take you through uh, the topic that reads uh, climate change and social justice, the vision from the South. And to start with, I'll provide an outline of the things that I'm going to cover. Generally, brief background on climate change and social justice, and why is it important uh, to consider social justice and human rights in climate change issues. I'll, I'll also give a perspective, a general perspective on dimensions of climate justice, uh, also the scope on which um, climate justice operate, uh, and when it comes to, to the impacts, uh, we need to understand the vulnerability to climate change that leads to uh, climate injustice. So I'll talk briefly about that. Uh, I'll also present about the, the impacts and uh, what we are currently implementing experiencing in relation to uh, uh, climate change impacts and in relation to climate justice, uh, the implications for policy and development and uh, different responses, both international and national responses, which means what our governments are, are doing to respond to the challenges. Um, 
I would like to start by this quote uh, for the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, which emphasizes that it is important that we have a collective action in dealing with uh, global challenges, uh, in which climate change is one of them. And human rights comes at the center of all the issues we need to consider in order to make sure that we are achieving the Agenda for Sustainable Development goal, but also climate change. <coughs> um, when we are talking about climate change, uh, the impacts are, are, are felt in different sectors differently. Uh, climate change impacts agriculture, uh, impacts are also felt on water and health. And these impacts are felt by different social groups. We have women, men, children, youth, and people with disabilities. We also uh, have people with old ages. So climate change impacts are felt differently by different social groups. So uh, when it comes to thinking of adaptation measures, we need to consider all these groups different and, and not uh, general. And some of the impacts, community impacts, are felt in terms of uh, access to resources, uh, decision making, uh, some impacts are felt on, on gender. And it's really important to make sure that in dealing with climate change challenge, we have to make sure that social justice uh, is considered and everyone uh, is part of the decision making process. So, there are a number of ways that has been identified as distinct dimension of justice. And these have been presented in different climate change and policy responses to it. So why is it important that we consider climate justice? Uh, with the different social groups and different development levels between developing and developed countries, uh, we are seeing that an equal responsibility to who bears the greater responsibility for emissions of greenhouse gases. Uh, also, there's an equal impact of climate change, which means who is more adversely uh, uh, impacted by extreme weather events that will increase in frequency and intensity, like how we have seen uh, on the previous presentations. Uh, Julia, Philip. Fidel presented the global perspective and projections on climate change and what we should expect in the future in terms of temperature increase, in terms of uh, precipitation, and what are we seeing now in terms of uh, concentration of carbon dioxide gases. Although he, pre he presented the global perspective, but we are also uh, facing the same challenges. So. Uh, the bigger picture that we have seen, uh, we have to downscale it to the level that uh, the, we understand the regional impacts, but also uh, local impacts to climate change. Uh, there's also an equal impact of policy responses in terms of who benefits from, from different, different policies and who bears the cost and burdens of mitigation and, and, and adaptation. Uh, policies, uh, who pays for uh, adaptation funding, and when it, it comes to mitigation measures, uh, we know very well that uh, private sector uh, plays an important role, but how do we make sure that private sector is part and parcel of this process, and what kind of climate solutions should be in place in order to make sure that uh, both mitigation and adaptation challenge uh, policies becomes a success. Yeah. And we also have some procedural justice where uh, there are, we need to understand the power relations and who has the power to make and affect policies responses to climate change. And this ranges from both large scale and local scale, but also decision making uh, between different groups and between uh, gender. So it is important to have understanding on all these uh, four dimensions of climate justice. Uh, in terms of scope, 
Uh, the scope ranges from the international uh, perspective where we have the United Nations and we have uh, the United Nations framework on climate change. We also have regional perspective where we have uh, the African Union, but also impacts are felt in individual countries where we have uh, uh, a number of African countries, but each country is, uh, feels uh, climate change impacts differently depending on the level of technology, economic development, and the ability to, to cope and adapt uh, to, to, to climate change challenges. And uh, we, we have also seen uh, different communities also are being felt, uh, are being impacted differently by climate change. So the scope of climate uh, justice ranges from large scale to small scale. And we, it is important to make sure that uh, uh, the large decision, the, the global decisions uh, impacts positively uh, individuals but also local communities. Uh, and when we are talking to um, climate change impacts, we need to understand the vulnerability that leads to, to the impacts. And here we need to uh, understand how disadvantaged different individuals or groups are impacted by extreme weather events, for example, uh, droughts and, and, and the floods. And here we have two important factors. There is exposure, which is the likelihood to which a person or community or individual or even an economic sector is exposed to the challenges of climate change. But also, we have the vulnerability, which is the likelihood and degree to which the event will result into loss in well-being or infrastructure. So there are a number of factors that make a person or community or an economic sector vulnerable to climate change, and it ranges from personal factors to social factors. And talking about personal factors, we are seeing biophysical characteristics of people, such as age or health. Uh, it is likely that uh, people of old age will be more impacted with uh, heat waves, and even diseases such as uh, malaria and dengue uh, uh, children and people with old age um, faced with a number of challenges, a lower immunity being one of them. So uh, talking about climate change impacts on, at individual levels depends on the physical characteristics of a person. But we also have environmental factors, uh, which are physical attributes of neighborhoods, such as green space or drainage, <laughs> and uh, quality uh, of life and the elevation of housing in terms of coastal communities. <coughs> and here, a number of environmental factors might contribute to uh, the vulnerability of people to climate change. For example, people in, <coughs> the poor people in urban areas, most of them are living in uh, flood-prone areas. So when it comes to high intensity rainfall, as, uh, as presented in in the previous uh, presentation, these are the ones to feel the impacts of climate change heavily. And the same, there are social factors uh, where we have social characteristics of people. And here we have a uh, level of income and inequality, social networks, and individuals' degree of social uh, isolations. And in developing countries, social networks becomes a, uh, it is a very important uh, factor for people to cope with different challenges, including climate change. So this, all these are the most important uh, things to be considered. So talking about the general climate change impacts on the African continent, uh, we are seeing that climate change and variability have the potential to uh, exacerbate existing threats to human security, including food, health, and economic insecurity, which are all being of particular concern for Africa. So uh, currently, Africa is having a number of challenges, and climate change comes on top of all these other factors that uh, the African continent is experiencing currently. And uh, 
based on the I, IPCC report of 2007, uh, a two degree temperature increase above the pre-industrial level will permanently uh, reduce up to 5% of annual per capita consumption in Africa. So we all need to understand what does these statistics mean to climate justice? What does these statistics mean to human rights? And how different groups will be uh, impacted by, uh, by this change in capital consumption in, in Africa? But not only uh, impacts on the GDP and economic development, but also we are, we are seeing that climate change will increase burden of range of human health uh, outcomes. And it is expected that malaria will put 90 million people, more people at risk in sub-Saharan Africa. And this is felt uh, due to temperature increase and the impacts are felt in mountainous areas and which usually are cold and they never had malaria in the past. But now we are seeing temperature increase uh, like in the, in the southern, the northern part of Tanzania, different cases of uh, malaria has been reported. And these people are not used uh, to uh, such a disease. You cannot compare the resilience of people from the coastal areas and the ones from the, the mountains. Uh, another health challenge that is currently uh, experienced in the past two to three years is dengue fever, which is also associated to temperature increase. And each time we are having a rain season, uh, dengue incidences are reported. So other uh, expected impacts are on water availability but also decreased uh, yields. As you all understand, more than 80% uh, of uh, Tanzanian and African agriculture is uh, rain-fed. And uh, due to um, high rainfall variabilities, but also the uncertainty on the onset and cessation of the, the rain, um, different challenges are felt by different communities and different crops on how to cope with uh, droughts where we, when it comes to prolonged period of, of drought, but also flooding. Some crops are not uh, tolerant to uh, water logged uh, challenges. So these are the kind of issues that need to be considered. Uh, this photo shows um, flood inc incidences in East Africa, and here is Dar es Salaam. And Due to poor infrastructure and drainage systems, uh, for urban dwellers in uh, urban pro prone, in flood prone areas are always felt with this kind of situation. So each rain season, they have to move uh, to, to the areas that they can stay there for a short period of time. But since they don't own land, and they, cannot, they don't have enough income to buy land in places that are not pr prone to flood. Each time they'll go back, and each time the rain season starts, they, they'll experience the same uh, challenges. And um, yield, especially for cereal crops, is projected to decrease in different parts of, uh, of Sub-Saharan Africa. So in South Africa and Zimbabwe, it is expected uh, a 30% decrease, and also 2% of soga, and 35% for wheat. And all these are crops that are both commercial and uh, food crops. So climate change impacts on agriculture will also hit, lead to economic uh, implications. Uh, we have a number of cities that are located along the coast, and in Africa, almost uh, 320 coastal cities uh, living in low elevation area, less than 10 meters. So sea level rise will increase the high socioeconomic and physical vulnerability of these coastal cities and communities. 
and it is expected that sea level rise and flooding will affect coastal populations and infrastructure in eastern, in eastern and western Africa. And these impacts will be faced both in mangroves and coastal degradation, which will both affect uh, fisheries and, and tourism. So what do we have to say about uh, uh, climate change and social justice? Uh, the photo on, on the left, we are seeing different social groups flooding, each one trying to save a life. We have kids, we have women and men. This is a, an extreme event where we have high flood incidences. On your right, we are having a prolonged uh, drought situation where maize crops are dying and people are not expecting anything. So this is the kind of situation uh, the countries and communities are exper experiencing uh, due to uncertainties and high variability. In a year, the two incidences can be experienced, so which makes it hard uh, to develop adaptation uh, measures because you are not sure of what will happen. So decision-making process in situation like this becomes a, t a challenge. And we really need to understand and develop early learning systems that will be able to uh, show this kind of situation and get prepared before uh, the impacts are felt. Uh, the, uh, this photo uh, shows a semi-arid part of northern, northern Tanzania where the Maasai lives, and this was February uh, this year where I did a gender study for the pastoralists and Maasai communities. And this is the only source of water for, for the village and both livestock and people depends on the same source. And people spend eight to 10 hours waiting for water because uh, this water here, there's a very small channel that moves from that part to the hole you are seeing. At, and that's where people are taking water for household use. So this is not felt on, agri on uh, water only, but all people's disease, but we also experiencing uh, crop diseases for tomatoes and banana. And uh, this kind of disease is very recent. And uh, currently, uh, uh, agricultural ex extension and practitioners, they, they, they still don't know what is the cause of this uh, situation, but it is associated with temperature increase, which has led to an outbreak of insects that, are, that can, currently are unknown, so studies need to be uh, done in order to, to understand how to control this kind of situation. But for tomato growers, once you are hit by this kind uh, of insects, all your crops will be gone. So there's a say in Swahili, once you are felt with this, you'll have to, to sh you will shout whether you like it or not because everything will be gone. So with all the impact that we have seen, uh, have both policy and development uh, impacts and uh, Failure to consider climate justice barriers to meaningful participation of vulnerable group may limit the effectiveness of both mitigation and adaptation policies uh, in uh, achieving their stated uh, objectives. And it is possible to at least make a nudge of uh, the social drivers of climate injustice by identifying and creating opportunities uh, for addressing the major causes of exclusion and marginalization. And when it comes to adaptation and mitigation policies, they, they both offer a new opportunity to go beyond highlighting structures of climate injustice embedded in socioeconomic systems uh, to break stereotypes and by recognizing key stakeholders and claimants of new low carbon uh, society. And, but all these aspects will require re conceptualization of capacity building for human rights and, uh, and climate justice 
as I've gone through uh, a number of publications and literatures, less has been done uh, uh, in climate change, in human rights and, and climate justice in African or developing countries uh, context. So it is also important for, for governments to have a positive understanding of climate justice and human rights issues related to climate change. It is important to make sure that all these uh, uh, aspects are well understood and the human rights and climate justice issues are part and parcel of, of, of policy and, and plans. So for the international perspective, we have the Paris Agreement and uh, it is great that the human right, rights is included in the preamble of the 2015 uh, uh, Paris Climate Change Agreement, and for developing countries, this is an important uh, <coughs> aspect that human rights issues are, are recognized uh, internationally, and also the, the impacts of disasters can be severe, striping away livelihood and progress on socioeconomic uh, development, and the Paris Agreement also recognized that economic losses from infrastructure alone can be massive impacts on public services, but also access to basic health care, water, and livelihoods. There are important elements that has been identified as human rights inclusive participation, and this falls around indigenous people, gender and climate finance, and the United Nations Framework on Climate Change, traditional knowledge platform for engagement, provide for local communities and indigenous, indigenous people and indigenous people's rights. We are not full uh, recognizing the final plat platform document of COP23, but the Lima Week program on gender and the gender action plan uh, considers some aspects of, of uh, climate justice. Another aspect is on climate finance where developed countries are supposed to support developing countries in, in terms of financial resources uh, in implementing the conventions and uh, the different types of funds has been uh, identified or developed and this includes the special climate change fund the least developing, developed countries fund, both man, managed by the uh, Global Environment of the GEF and the Green Climate Fund under uh, the Convention, as well as the Adaptation Fund under the Kyoto Protocol. So these are critical for the su successful achievement of both climate action as well as uh, the 2030 uh, sustainable development goals. And these funds are also important for developing countries in, to help them in different aspects, ranging from understanding of the, the impacts, developing adaptation measures, but also uh, creating resilient uh, systems in order to bounce back from the impacts of climate change, but the only challenge that developing countries are fair is how to access this kind of fund because it is not uh, straightforward and you have to go through a number of processes before this kind of funds are approved. And uh, the UNFCCC has also de developed participatory mechanisms in which uh, the National Adaptation Planning, the, the NAP, they are supposed to make sure that there is a must stakeholder participation in throughout the development process of the National Adaptation Plans. But uh, another policy uh, document is the, uh, the National de Determined Contribution to Mitigation where the convention also requires that the preparation and subsequent refining should include participatory process, which means different aspect, aspects and social groups should be part and parcel uh, of development of this uh, 
documents and all these are, are, are government uh, documents and they provide guidelines on how countries respond to adaptation and mitigation measures. So they also provide provision related to education and, and capacity building. So different countries are responding to different to different impacts of climate change. And here I'll give uh, an example of Tanzania and how the government is trying to, to respond in terms of policy. So a number of uh, policy and plans have been put in place in order to uh, provide directions on how to uh, cope with adaptation challenges and we have the National Adaptation Program of National of 2007, but we also have the National Climate Change Strategy. It is like an umbrella framework for climate change management in Tanzania. And it is important that we also have the National Climate Change Strategy on Gender and Climate Change, uh, which was developed in 2012. And this strategy is currently under review, <laughs> and some of the aspects that were not considered in 2012 are uh, expected to be part of the new development. So uh, issues related to human rights and climate justice are closely linked to gender issues, and it is important that uh, the new gender strategy also includes uh, aspe aspects of climate, uh, uh, of human rights. But we also have the Climate Smart Agriculture Program and the National Determined Contributions Plans. And it is important to note that uh, climate change strategy of 2012, although does not uh, acknowledge human rights or climate uh, justice issues directly, but it acknowledges gender and the differentiated vulnerability to climate change. So different groups uh, are considered in, in this policy, which is an important step in developing uh, adaptation measures for different sectors. But it also proposes integration of gender in programs, plans, and activities. And uh, this needs understanding, but also uh, practitioners and policymakers need to be uh, uh, trained on the importance of making sure that uh, gender issues are incorporated in all programs, plans, and activities. But also the strategy uh, has insisted on the collection of gender disaggregated data and greater women involvement in climate change, planning, and equity in benefit sharing. So. Uh, we have seen that this is a, an important aspect in, and a, a good step uh, in moving towards uh, ensuring that human rights and climate justice issues are considered in different uh, government programs and, and plans. Uh, to conclude, we have seen that um, lower income and other disadvantaged groups contribute least to, co to the causes of climate change, but are the most likely to be adversely impacted by its effects. And this is due to different uh, development and economic levels and how they are capable of responding to different challenges. Also, how disadvantaged person or group will will be, with respect to potential losers in, in well-being, will be a function of two distinct factors, which is exposure and vulnerabilities. So it is important to reduce exposure and vulnerabilities of different groups, sectors, and individuals to climate change impact. And it is also important uh, that other responses to take account of the inherent inequalities in the ways people are affected by events like uh, floods, droughts, and diseases, which are the most important aspects of both human rights and climate justice. Mucho gracias. <laughs> Bien.
también eh, eh, muchas gracias Mataca eh, yo creo que siguiendo la línea que hemos iniciado que hemos iniciado esta tarde eh, eh, la doctora eh, Madoka Tumbo eh, nos ha dado eh, una perspectiva que creo que es sumamente interesante, que es el, el carácter eh, transversal de los efectos del clima en todos los campos, en todo tipo de individuos, etc. Eh, como dirían en la, en, en la OTAN, ha adoptado un comprehensive approach para tratar de este tema de tal manera que nos hemos visto cómo afecta a todos los sectores, a todo tipo de personas y cómo se ha adoptado también lo que me parece sumamente interesante, que es el análisis de la evolución del clima desde lo que se llama el enfoque de derechos, que es lo que nos permite avanzar también en este campo. Bien, pues sin más, doy la palabra a aquel que quiera hacer algún comentario, alguna pregunta, alguna sugerencia, alguna inquietud. Aquí. Gracias. Sí. Gracias y enhorabuena por la ponencia. Dos preguntas. Eh, digamos, desde esa perspectiva, de esa visión desde el sur que anuncia el, el, el título de la ponencia. Eh, por una parte. Me gustaría saber su opinión respecto a si las políticas locales que se estén adaptando, entiendo en el caso de Tanzania o en el, los, los casos regionales que pueda conocer, esas políticas locales me gustaría saber hasta qué punto responden a decisiones locales, a un, digamos, una apropiación del problema por parte de, la, de las autoridades eh, políticas o administrativas locales o hasta qué punto hay una interacción con organismos internacionales y con, sí, vamos, con agencias y con organismos internacionales en lo que se refiere a la, a la respuesta frente al, al cambio climático. ¿Qué hay de decisión local? ¿Qué hay de participación en esfuerzos globales? Esa sería una pregunta. La segunda es, eh, a veces... Muchas veces, de hecho, escuchamos un debate de para países en desarrollo hay que encontrar un equilibrio entre acceder a energías y mantener vías de consumo, si se quiere, o patrones de consumo que pueden ser, que puede que no ayuden eh, a, a luchar contra el cambio climático, pero por otra parte, pues bueno, no han sido los primeros, no han sido los que han provocado el problema, con lo cual re, re, se respondería sobre la necesidad o la justicia de, de no imponer un peso excesivo. ¿Ve usted una, una elección? ¿Hay, ¿Hay algún margen para decir podemos también los países en vías de desarrollo eh, evitarnos tomar decisiones drásticas? ¿O es algo en lo que también debemos estar, debemos de ser parte? Muchas gracias. ¿Should I respond or wait for a, uh, okay. um, In my opinion. Uh, you want to understand uh, how local policy, local and regional policies, you want to understand to what extent they respond to local challenges and the relationship with which uh, the international requirements um, influence uh, local policy development. Uh, In my opinion, in my opinion, I think um, the major government policies responds to the UNFCCC, so they are um, driven from from above. But the kind of issues in which the policies should respond to, they are local. So they you need to consider the current 
situation uh, on the ground. So although they are having a global perspective, but the content and the way in which uh, they are supposed to be implemented is local. So uh, in my opinion, I think um, there's a very good understanding on the issues when you compare now and in the past. And for the past documents that had been developed, they never had any link to, to a local understanding on uh, the national development issues. But it's good that now there's an advancement on understanding of climate change issues and the expectation is that for the new policies, the one that are being re re reviewed currently, and the one, the one that will be developed will consider more the local issues and not only responding to uh, international requirements. And we have a number of policies and plans. The only challenge that countries face is the implementation. We have very good uh, policy documents, but no implementation. So <laughs> we have a list of different documents responding to, to climate change issues in, in every sector, but no implementation. So at least now for the, for the gender, for the Ministry of Gender, at least they've taken a step to include gender in planning process. So at least we are sure that uh, there will be a budget for gender issues, yeah, but for other sectors like agriculture, water, still a, a lot of work needs to be done to make sure that uh, government budget considers climate change issues. Otherwise, um, there's no link between development plans and uh, climate change budget, yeah. And there's high dependence on, on donors when it comes to implement all to implement all policies and, and documents. So this needs to, to change. Uh, government needs to take step in order to achieve uh, its objectives. Uh, you also wanted to understand the balance in access to energy and the requirement uh, for keeping consumption, consumption patterns. You, here you mean the energy consumption patterns that may not be helping in fighting climate change. And you also wanted to know if it's fair, all these are just dramatic uh, decisions. So when it comes to, uh, uh, to energy, we all understand that uh, uh, we mostly depend on um, renewable energy, charcoal, that is the major source of uh, uh, energy for, for cooking. And the largest number of people depends on this kind. So deforestation is inevitable. And um, given the fact that um, we don't have alternative source of energy, uh, responding to this ch challenge or oh, this requirement will be a huge uh, uh, will be a huge um, challenge to governments because unless they provide alternative source of energy, that's when they can uh, respond to this uh, requirement. But without it, deforestation will continue as as it is, and I think these decisions or requirements should be reconsidered <coughs> by the international communities and more focus may be put more maybe on wind energy and solar energy, which are also, the, the initial investments are also expensive. So all these things need to be considered when it comes to energy. Uh, to energy issues. Yes, we have alternative wind or solar energy, but the expenses related to initial investments are, are huge for the government to, to achieve. For uh, 
appreciate your explanation. And uh, as far as uh, we are in a legal bar and we are uh, lawyers, and then my question is, uh, uh, speaking about uh, social justice, I think it could be important to uh, to have a tribunal, you know, a court of justice, yes, to deal with these cases of uh, unfair treatment of uh, fundamental rights, as, uh, as you have explained, <coughs> discrimination of uh, South and North, or whatsoever health, or whatsoever production, agriculture production, etc. And as far as it's concerned, I ask you, there is any case of uh, damage claim or whatsoever in Tanzania, or at least have you uh, asked for uh, an international tribunal just to deal with these kind of cases? Currently, no. <laughs> and maybe in future. And um, I like the idea that uh, um, the Lawyers Association is part of organization of this uh, conference. And in Tanzania, we have the, the Tanganyika <laughs> Law Society. But they are not much involved with climate change issues. And when we were having lunch, and you mentioned that we'll be having lawyers, I, I just thought this will be an important information to be communicated to the Tanganyika Law Society so that they can start understanding the, these issues. Because they are the ones to help us with, uh, with the cases and, and building cases. and. and uh, providing claims for for such kind of issues. So, thank you very much for your questions, and I'll I'll share the idea <laughs> with the lawyers in Tanzania. But currently, nothing is happening. Uh, Muy buenas tardes y felicidades por la eh, disertación. Eh, soy Lenin Pomari, eh, boliviano, eh, profesor de Derecho Ambiental. Lo que la compañera preguntó, eh, mi presidente actual propuso un tribunal internacional de los derechos de la madre tierra. Pero cuando uno analiza desde una reflexión crítica, pues tiene muchas contradicciones en las políticas públicas de ciencia y tecnología o en las políticas públicas sobre derechos de la madre tierra. Por ejemplo, la violación eh, de los derechos humanos de los pueblos indígenas, la construcción de hidroeléctricas donde no se consulta a los pueblos indígenas. Entonces, encontramos muchas contradicciones. Entonces, en base a eso, mi pregunta va eh, lo siguiente. Un gobierno que se posiciona como defensor de la madre tierra, en el caso de Bolivia, desde su constitución política del Estado, o en el caso del Ecuador, que tiene una visión de cuidar la madre tierra, o cuidar la naturaleza, ¿no? pero en su accionar ¿no? vulneran derechos ambientales. Entonces, desde, desde su criterio del sur, o desde su criterio como investigadora, ¿Cómo debería ser un gobierno? ¿no? Porque un gobierno, en el caso boliviano, aspira a desarrollarse, ¿no? aspira a, no sé, a un centro nuclear, aspira a industria, pero a la par, desde la filosofía o de su pensamiento, desde la constitución política de Estado, quiere cuidar la madre tierra. ¿no? Entonces, ¿cuál es el intermedio? ¿Qué se puede hacer? ¿no? Desde una visión científica, no se dice una visión de la idea de justicia ¿por qué? ¿No? cuando le preguntan a un político boliviano del, of, del oficialismo del gobierno ¿no? ¿por qué están construyendo esto? no, queremos desarrollar pero desarrollo a cuesta de qué ¿No? vulnerando Bien, derechos humanos yo creo que okay. la ponente ya ha cogido la idea yeah, I, I tried. I think you want to understand what should be done when it comes to competition between development and environmental conservation. Is it right? Yeah, I think for most uh, developing countries that is the case. So 
even if you are saying in Bolivia uh, the president has established uh, the mother earth tribunal, but uh, what is in the documents is contrary to what the government is currently doing. So for, my, for me, I think uh, politicians should, uh, should make sure that uh, they do what uh, uh, they, they become true to the action that they are proposing. So if you, if you want to make sure that uh, the environment is conserved and the rights of indigenous peoples uh, is in place, uh, I think there are different uh, environmental aspects that uh, provide guidance on how to deal with development uh, at the same time conserve the environment. Uh, we have tools such as environmental impact assessment. I think this should provide the picture and the impacts in which how different groups of people will be uh, impacted with such development and there should be a public hearing. So I think, I don't know in Bolivia, but in Tanzania environmental impact assessment is a requirement by act and no development will be uh, done without um, carrying out the environmental impact assessment. And impacts of uh, environmental impacts on the environment and, and social communi communities, if they are higher than uh, the expected uh, requirement, the project will not be allowed to, to continue. So uh, and at the higher level, there is also a strategic environmental assessment that takes care of policies and plans because, b before they become projects. So I think uh, these environmental tools, such as strategic environmental assessment and environmental impact assessment, uh, should be uh, part and parcel of all the economic development projects. And they can help in taking care of that. The, uh, environmental rights as well as in individual indigenous people rights are unconsidered. I think I have tried to, to answer your question. Alguna otra question? Duda? Comentario? Bueno, pues eh, vuelvo a dar eh, las gracias a la profesora una vez más por una exposición tan clarificante, tan enfocada en derechos y que nos servirá seguramente de punto de reflexión para eh, las, las ponencias y las comunicaciones que tenemos a continuación y mañana. Así pues, eh, levantamos la sesión y damos paso a las comunicaciones que tienen lugar ahora. Gracias a todos y gracias a la profesora.